petroleum-based in-flight fires. Petroleum-based in-flight fires are something very different and very dangerous as compared to an electrical fire. The most important thing to consider about an in-flight petroleum-based fire is, once you recognize it as such, you must stop your engine. That's right. You reach over and grab that throttle, pull it back, and leave it back. Period. And then you pull the mixture control back and shut the engine down. And turn the boost pump off if it's on too. Here, you want to make sure your fuel selector is turned to the off position. Your objective is to keep the fuel from being directed to where the fire is. And the second thing you do is to close your air vents to make sure that none of the smoke and the toxic effluvium gets into the cockpit, which wouldn't be a good thing for you. The third thing you would do is turn off your master switch if it's on. It's entirely possible that your airplane's avionics cooling fans take air from outside the airplane, as most do, and pump it over the electrical equipment. And that means there's a possibility that these avionic fans might pump smoke into the cockpit, which is no bueno for you. Now, you must find a way to extinguish the fire. A fire extinguisher is probably not going to help in this instance since the fire is in front of the firewall where the engine is. So, the best way to extinguish the fire is by speeding the airplane up. No, not to blow out the fire, but to increase the airflow so much that the burning fuel-air mixture becomes too lean to continue burning. In some of their POHs, Cessna says that in order to extinguish the fire, you're looking at speeding up to a minimum of 100 knots and more if this speed fails to extinguish the fire. The objective here is to change the mixture of the fire. In other words, to add more air for a given fuel source which leans the mixture sufficiently to extinguish the flames. I have a test pilot friend who used to fly DC-6s for the military. He once had the duty to discover what minimum dive speed was necessary to extinguish a cavitated engine fire. He would take the airplane up and purposely ignite a prearranged package that would burn under an engine cowling. He discovered that he had to fly at a minimum of 130 knots to extinguish the fire. It's reasonable to assume that the faster you go, the more likely you are to extinguish the fire. Remember, you're not trying to slow down to prevent the fire from getting oxygen. Clearly, it's getting enough oxygen as is. You want to give it as much oxygen as possible to extinguish it by leaning its mixture to the point where combustion is impossible. The next thing you should be thinking is, how can I get this airplane out of the sky as soon as possible and where is the best place to put it down? Have you ever practiced getting an airplane out of the sky in the shortest possible period of time? Well, how would you do this? For our next maneuver, we're going to simulate getting this airplane out of the air in the shortest period of time. So, I want to make sure there's nobody below me, so I'm going to make a clearing turn here. Alright, so how would I do that? Getting the airplane out of the air in the shortest period of time. Power back. Now, I could add flaps, but won't do that in this situation. Watch this. Nose down. Going to bank the airplane. Going to put it into a good 60 degree bank and I'm letting that speed increase. And my descent right now is phenomenal. Now I haven't even increased the speed above what I could increase. In other words, I could go all the way up to DME here. This gets the airplane out of the air in a very short period of time. Minimizing Impact Deceleration At 50 knots ground speed, and by the way, all these speeds are based on ground speed here, we must stop in no less than 12.3 feet to experience no more than 9 Gs of deceleration. At 60 knots, we must stop in no less than 17.8 feet. At 70 knots, we must stop in no less than 24.2 feet. At 80 knots, we must stop in no less than 31.7 feet. At 90 knots, we must stop in no less than 40 feet. And at 100 knots, we must stop in no less than 49.5 feet to experience no more than 9 Gs of deceleration. The greater the distance used to stop the airplane, the less the damage 
to the airplane and its contents. And by the way, that's you and your passengers. Here's a good example of having the wings absorb the energy of impact, although this pilot didn't plan on doing what he did here. This fellow crashed into the second story window of an unoccupied office building. The departure runway is to the left of that brick wall. On his first attempt at taking off in a Cessna 172 with four people on board on a high density altitude day, he did become airborne but was unable to climb. The departure runway was 1,900 feet long and he aborted his first takeoff attempt in enough time to stop on the runway. This fellow, however, wasn't a quitter. He returned for takeoff and decided to use 20 degrees of flaps to assist with shortening his ground roll. Well, flaps did give him a shorter ground roll, but he was unable to climb more than 15 feet once he became airborne. That's when he drifted over the fence and flew right into the second story of that building. The wings were bent back and the airplane came to a stop in about what looks like mm, 10 feet. All four of the people on board the airplane got out dusted themselves off and walked downstairs. When the secretary on the lower floor saw them, she asked, hey, how did you folks get here? And at that point, I believe the pilot replied, ah, uh, we flew in. Well, the point here is that this airplane, during its deceleration, pulled less than nine Gs simply because it was able to stop in about 10 feet worth of distance. I'm simulating elevator control failure. The elevator's frozen. I'm going to control the airplane just with waters. And going to use power for pitch. I'm going to set the flaps at 20 degrees, which is pretty much what we have them set at now. We'll see if we can control this airplane here. Now, it's always best to give yourself as long a final as you can so that you can plot, plan, and scheme a little bit better. So I make that turn, I know that nose is going to drop down, so I'm going to add just a little bit of power. But I do want to start down. So let's see how this works out here. And I am applying rudder to make a turn, so it essentially becomes a skidding turn. Therefore, I'm going to be careful how I use rudder. I'm not going to jab it in like I'm trying to step on some gigantic, ugly bug. So let's see what we have here. It's not graceful, but, you know, it does work. a lag when you apply power here, so. Like I say, it's not pretty. as close to the runway as you can. Uh, once you get it down there, you can do some amazing things in terms of uh, making the airplane rentable again, let's say. Here we go. And that's where I draw the line right there. All right, I think that's enough for me today. Greetings folks, I'm Rod Machado and I'm pleased to introduce my new e-learning course on in-flight emergencies. And the primary goal of this course is to answer two questions that are often on every pilot's mind. How safe are the airplanes we fly? And if anything happens in an airplane, will I be able to handle the problem? You see, unlike airline pilots, corporate pilots, and military pilots, Private pilots are often not provided with significant training on handling in-flight emergencies. And in many instances, the private pilot is given the POH, 
pointed to a corner of the flight school and told to read the emergency section. And this often comprises the total of a pilot's emergency training. Unfortunately, the POH is often silent on, or at least offers very little depth on the techniques for handling many possible, though rare, in-flight emergencies. As a result of this deficiency of information, a subtle but often well, significant transformation might occur in some pilots. As we acquire more experience, we typically begin to wonder what we would do if an emergency happened while aloft and how we would handle it. And after several hundred hours thinking about these questions and having no immediate and satisfying answers to them, anxiety begins to take root and begins to grow in a pilot's mind. Now, should that anxiety reach a significant level, a pilot might wake up one day and find him or herself making excuses not to fly. After all, no flight means no anxiety about flight. And the problem is that we spend a lot of our precious time and money learning to do something we love doing and are now compelled to abandon it just to have some peace of mind. Well, I don't want that to happen to you. Thus, the reason for this course. In addition to covering the in-flight emergencies pilots are most likely to encounter, and these are the ones that you've thought about before, this course also addresses some of the most unusual, bizarre, strange emergencies that a pilot might experience. Now, my intent is not to scare you here. I can assure you, it's unlikely that you'll ever experience even one serious emergency during your entire career as an aviator. Ultimately, this course will make you a more confident and capable pilot.